Hello, I'm Maria Cooper, Gary Cooper's daughter, and welcome to the 50th anniversary tribute to High Noon. It's a real pleasure for me. You know, High Noon was a movie that my father was especially proud of, and it's a film that meant a great deal to my whole family. My father didn't appear in as many westerns as his friends, Joel McRae, Jimmy Stewart, Duke Wayne, Randy Scott, and Glenn Ford. But he did become known as the archetypal Western hero. 50th anniversary? It doesn't seem possible. You know, high noon has even become part of the lexicon. To be high noon means to be left in the lurch. Talk about enduring. The idea really came to my father in about 1947, and he wrote a four-page outline. And in that time, uh, someone brought to the attention of my father a story, a short story called The Ten Star that had been published in one of the slicks, one of those uh, magazines that published short stories in those days. And uh, he read it, and it was very similar to the I idea he'd had, and he wasn't sure if it, maybe he'd even read The Ten Star. I mean, there are differences in the two stories. Um, but he then optioned The Ten Star anyway. And uh, eventually, um, after uh, the men and champion and Serenade Bergerac had all been made, it became time to make uh, High Noon. Um, and they found, you know, Fred Zinnemann to direct it. Well, first of all, as a child growing up in Vienna, he was uh, fascinated by the West uh, through a series of books by a German author called Karl May, who was very popular at the time, and he wrote uh, a series of fantasy westerns. But he himself had never been to America or the West, but. It, uh, it fired up my father's imagination, and so when he became involved with movies, westerns were something that were very dear to his heart. This was Fred Zinnemann's first and only western, and some doubted that an Austrian Jew could direct a western, the most American of genres. To be able to go out on a school night to Long Beach to see his latest movie and also, the fact that it was a Western, I was, couldn't have been more excited. After it was over, people, all the executives, were forming into little groups, whispering, and I just went into the bathroom where two other executives were, and I heard one of them say to the other, well, you know, what does a European Jew know about making Westerns anyway? My father and, and, and Zinnemann worked very, very closely on the script before they went into production. And they, of course, they'd had many drafts, but they went over it, you know, line by line, you know, very intensely. The picture was made in 28 days for $750,000, so they didn't have the luxury of time, and they didn't have time to experiment. That's right, and Fred and his old friend cinematographer Floyd Crosby developed a different look. They patterned that look after the Civil War photographs of Matthew Brady. Together, they developed a style uh, which was a washed-out sky with a, a newsreel look to it. And he wanted something that looked very much like a documentary photograph. And he was helped, uh, he said, in his efforts by the uh, smog in the valley because they were forced to shoot most of this in the Columbia back lot uh, because of the tight schedule and the tight budget. And uh, so, in most cases, they had a a very hazy sky every day and which helped them get this effect. The trouble is they still had no leading man. And considering how closely Gary Cooper is identified with Marshall Will Kane, it's hard to believe that anybody had the misgivings they did about him being cast in that role. It wasn't as though he couldn't act. After all, he had won an Oscar for Sergeant York. Well, it may have been a case of what have you done for me lately? Gary Cooper uh, was considered by the studio to be uh, a, an aging actor who had, who no longer had the box office appeal that he'd had before, and he had just come off two flops. So, so nobody was that eager to see Gary Cooper in a movie. They were worried about him, his age because the character as written was only was supposed to be in his mid thirties, like like most Hollywood heroes actually, and. Um, they were slightly worried about that, but of course that works wonderfully well, as it turns out. As there were misgivings about Fred Zinnemann and Gary Cooper, why should Grace Kelly have been any different, especially after her first meeting with Fred? 
she came and was wearing white gloves and answered every question with a yes or a no and was very prim and proper. And my father, who's not very good in those sorts of, of making people feel at ease when they don't, um, didn't know quite what to say with her, but felt that she would be perfect for the role because he wanted just that feeling in, in the part. And she was kind of, uh, I was going to say bashful, but, but uh, she wasn't totally satisfied with, with, with her performance. Uh, uh, she, she felt it, I guess she felt kind of awkward, and, and it, 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 it's, it's not an easy role. And also there was a big, there was a 30-year uh, age difference between Cooper and Grace Kelly, and uh, he was somewhat worried about that but he decided somehow to, to make that work and he used it in the film. I guess it was hard for any leading lady ne to be next to Gary Cooper. High Noon had more problems than casting in a tight shooting schedule. The 50s were dark times. The McCarthy hearings were in full swing and there was a lot of paranoia going on in Hollywood and a few of the members of the people on this picture were caught up in that. One of them was Floyd Crosby and another was Carl Foreman. My father put it to um, Gary Cooper and his friend Bruce Church, who was the uh, Republican businessman who put up a lot of the money for the film. Um, you know, whether they felt comfortable with him staying on board and um, they not only made it clear they were comfortable with him staying on board, that they would only stay on board if he remained in the film. Carl Foreman saw High Noon as an allegory about his own uh, persecution during the McCarthy era. It was partially intended as an allegory of the blacklist. Is that, that's absolutely the case. And it's a fascinating study of gender, way ahead of its time. The Helen Ramirez character, played by Katie Harado, is, is fascinating, completely unlike m most equivalent characters, not only um, you know, is she not killed saving the white? You know, f the fact that she's there at all, you know, the fact that there is a Mexican person in this town, it's, it's also quite interesting. In it, that, you know, it's not, it is of some significance. Secondly, she's um, a businesswoman, she's a widow. She owns the saloon and she's a silent partner in the general store. She's one of the m more important business people of the town, you know, which is a sort of notion that, you know, must have been fairly unusual. And in the 1950s, we didn't think of that kind of thing then which is why it has such resonance today. It's also a terrific suspense film. I mean, it's just a great story. It keeps reappearing over the years because, it, because of its timelessness. And you, you can say it's about the McCarthy era. You can say it's about, you, you can say it's about something that's going on now. It's because it's about dealing with fear. I mean, I think that's, that's part of it. It's also perhaps people see, you know, America as, as going alone in a world that's either indifferent or hostile, or certainly or cowardly, too cowardly to help against a, a dangerous enemy. It just relates to everybody through the ages, and I think that's why it's had the success that it's had. And when it came to award time, High Noon the movie was definitely not High Noon, left in the lurch. It received nominations for Best Picture, Director, Screenplay, and Cinematography. And Dimitri Tiomkin won two Oscars for Best Title Ballad and the Best Score. Elmo Williams won for his brilliant editing. And my father, Gary Cooper, walked away with his second Academy Award. Thank you for joining us for this brief look behind High Noon. I'm Maria Cooper. <laughs>